Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Daniele is going to be talking about the formations of W algebras and differential difference equations. So if you start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Flor, and thanks for moving the time for this talk. So the, yeah, the plan is to say something about uh, the formation of W algebras. And um, so first I want to explain what kind of W algebras I will consider and uh, what kind of deformations and then uh, the context on which we want to talk about this deformation and give some application which would be mainly to this differential difference equation. So to start, let's let me recall um, um, some way to define W algebras. So um, this object were uh, maybe first introduced by Drinker and Sokolov in relation to integrable systems. So they constructed uh, an integrable hierarchy of differential equations, actually of partial differential equations, which could be written in some um, Hamiltonian form. But what was remarkable is that these um, equations are associated to some algebraic object, to simply algebra, for example. And so there is um, kind of an algebraic way to construct analytic objects. So that's already very nice um, per se. But also there is a lot of structure which uh, which started to be investigated. And um, let me give an example of uh, an integrable hierarchy, which is kind of the simplest example. It's associated to the Lie algebra SL2. So actually, integrable hierarchy means that we have an infinite sequence of partial differential equations with some properties. So I won't write down uh, all the equations, of course, since they're infinite, but so for G equal SL2, these equations are equation in one dependent variable U. And let me just stress that. So the number of dependent variable, so in this case, it's just one. And this is the dimension of the central, the dimension of the centralizer of the important element F in SL2. So this allows to generalize the construction to, to W algebras and try to um, give an idea of what kind of equation. So when the V algebra becomes bigger, we have more dependent variables. So we have U1 up to UK, where K is the dimension of the centralizer of some important element in the V algebra. And so we have an evolution equation. So we have the U over the TN, where N is a non-negative positive integer. And the right hand side is a polynomial in these uh, different uh, dependent variables and all their derivatives. So, for example, uh, in this uh, SL2 case, the first equation of the hierarchy is very simple. So, it's du dt1 equal du dx. And then the second equation is this. Uh, oops. Equation which has a linear term which is the third derivative of u with respect to x in the right hand side. And then it has a nonlinear term, which is u times the u dx. And this equation is known as the KDV equation, Kortelag debris equation. And it describes the, we may think of u as the height of um, the water in a shallow canal. And uh, Cordelag and the recent were two Dutch mathematicians. So maybe they were looking at canals in, in Amsterdam and then they got with got up with this equation. And the whole set of equations for any time variable Tn is known as the KDV hierarchy. So the inference of Roth developed the whole certain machinery to associate to the Lie algebra SL2, this set of equations, and show some properties on the flows. They commute. That's why this, uh, all these equations are called integrable. But what is uh, important in that construction is that, yeah, this Hamiltonian structure, which is responsible 
of the const of the definition of this uh, equation is now is known as a uh, a classical W algebra associated to G. And actually it's called principal since we can generalize this construction to other elements, other nilpotent elements. In this case, this we use the principal nilpotent, but we can uh, use other uh, nilpotent elements. And there were also many other uh, different generalization and application of this construction. But we will stick to this kind of principal W algebras. So we may think it's an Hamiltonian structure on an infinite dimensional space. So it's a kind of infinite dimensional Poisson manifold. So that's a kind of analytic part. But it has a very nice interpretation, algebraic interpretation, which uh, was given by Feynman and Frankel. And uh, this interpretation is as follows. So we take the universal of fine vertex algebra. And so this universal affine vertex algebra, we will review the definition later, depends on some parameter, which is called the level. And it has a very uh, nice behavior. So when the level is different from the so-called critical level, the center is uh, one dimension, so it's trivial. But when we take the critical level, we have a non-trivial center. And this non-trivial center, Fagin and Frankel showed that this, uh, it's isomorphic to the W algebras, not of the Lie algebra G, but of the Langlands dual Lie algebra. So basically, it's the Lie algebra obtained by considering uh, not the Cartan matrix of G, but its transpose. And um, what is what can we say about this the, the Poisson structure, the algebraic structure of this um, center? Well, the universal of fine vertex algebra, as I say, depends on some parameter k, which is called the level. So this level gives a filtration on the vertex algebra. And it's possible to show that the center now carries a certain structure, which is not the structure of vertex algebra, but of its classical limit. And its classical limit is known as a Poisson vertex algebra, which we should think as a the analog of Poisson algebra, but for infinite dimensional manifold. That's why they arise in this uh, kind of hierarchy. So Poisson algebras are useful to describe uh, ordinary differential equations. So we have a finite dimension of phase space. If we go to an infinite dimension of phase space, we have we are dealing with PDs, and the analog of a Poisson algebra becomes a Poisson vertex algebra. I'll try to be a little bit more clear about this later. But what is nice about this construction is that it allows a very straightforward way to generalize the construction of these W classical W algebras to their Q deformations because of the following uh, reason. So in the, um, improving the famous result, Fagin and Prangle observed the, the center of the universal affine vertex algebra at the critical level is asomorphism, asomorphic as a vector space to the center of another object, which is now it's not a vertex object. It's an, so it's an associative algebra. So it's while vertex algebra, we know it's they're not associative. So this associative algebra is a certain completion of the universal developing algebra of the Kantz-Moody of the affinization of G at the critical level. So now it's clear how can we uh, trying to define a deformation of this W algebra. Just replace this universal enveloping algebra with the quantum affine analog. So we replace U tilde of G at the critical level by U tilde Q of G at the critical level. So this allows to define uh, what is the Q deformation of the langlands dual classical W algebra associated to G. As just the center of this uh, object. Now we have an, an associative algebra. It contains infinite sum, but we can perform some computation and see what happens. So we, we may take this as a definition. And a lot of people work on this, like I think first uh, uh, among the first authors were Frank Rechetikin, Semenotian Shansky, Sebastianov, and many others. So this is one way to, to define a Q from W algebra. And um, let's say 
what I want to explain in this talk is this kind of question. So now we have this um, Q deform W algebra. And it is obtained as the center of the quantum affine algebra at certain, uh, certain completion of the quantum affine algebra at the critical level. But can we recover similar structure as we have done uh, as we move for uh, the Griffith Soros construction? So now, can we find this? Can we realize this as the center of some vertex algebra like object? And as we said before, the center of the affine W algebra, the affine universal vertex algebra, is a Poisson vertex algebra. So if we go to the Q deform world, can we say that this WQ has a Poisson vertex algebra like structure? So, and this is what I'll try to focus more about this question. Try to give an answer to this. Because the, the first question is a little bit obscure to me yet. So let's try to work at the classical uh, level. And uh, let me try to explain some motivation because we want to find some kind of Poisson vertex algebra like structure of these Q deform W algebras. So, do you have some questions about the plan? Okay. So, let me try to make some uh, a little bit of philosophy. So if we take uh, a vector space, then in the category of vector space, we can find some certain objects which have some further properties. So they are Lie algebras. And uh, so we know these Lie algebras very well. And to any Lie algebra, we can associate it two objects. One is commutative and one is non-commutative. So how do we do this? So, to get the commutative algebra, we just take the symmetric algebra of this Lie algebra. And then we can make this into a Poisson algebra. Just we define uh, for elements in L, the Poisson bracket is just the same as the commutator in the Lie algebra, the Lie bracket. And then we extend by imposing the Leibniz rule. So this is the, the so called Kirillov constant Pos uh, Poisson algebras, not Poisson vertex algebra. So I will find a lot of mistakes on the way. So um, this is some classical object, and it's we may think as the algebra function of a finite dimensional Poisson manifold. And then we can find some commutative object just by considering the universal enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra L. And this is an associative algebra now. So we lose commutativity. In fact, there is a measure of how this um, algebra is far from being commutative. And this is given by the Lie bracket itself. So if we want to compute AB minus BA, it is given by this Lie bracket. And we may write, let me write as certain function of the Lie bracket. So now it's, the function is just uh, the identity. And similarly, we can, uh, have a measure of how far this algebra is from being associative by a certain function g, which uh, I write g of a, b, c, but actually depends only on the b bracket. And for the universal enveloping algebra, this function is trivially, is constant zero, so we have associativity. But in general, it may happen that g is different from zero. And we can move from uh, one object to the other. So by taking the so-called associated graded. So the universal enveloping algebra is a filtered algebra. We take the associated graded and we get some commutative um, object. And so this identity, AB minus BA equal the commutator becomes the Poisson bracket of AB equal the commutator. So this is something very standard. And it's just something that we associated to a very special object in the category of vector space, to Lie algebras. So now let's try to, to see what happens if on our vector space, we have some extra structure. So we have the, um, for example, we may assume that there is a, the action of a linear operator. 
So we just take some C of T module where T is a linear operator. And then the analog of uh, the algebra becomes what is known as a formal algebra. So instead of having a Lie bracket which takes values in uh, R, we have some similar Lie bracket which takes values in polynomials in R. So there is a certain lambda. And lambda is here just to, it reminds ourselves of the action of T, of the linear operator. And this is called a lambda bracket. So we may think this is the analog of Lie algebra, but in the category of C of T module. And as we have done before, we can um, construct a commutative object in a commutative object. So the commutative object is now what is called a Poisson vertex algebra. And the formula is very similar to the one we wrote before. So for, for elements in R, the lambda bracket, the Poisson vertex algebra lambda bracket is exactly the same as the Lie conformal algebra lambda bracket. So this is analog to what happened before. And this is known as affine Poisson vertex algebra. And we can construct a commutative object. So this is called the universal affine vertex algebra. It carries a product which is uh, non-commutative and non-associative. Usually it's denoted with this uh, semicolon and it's called the normally ordered product. And again, how far is this normally ordered product from being commutative? This is given by a certain function f, which depends only on the lambda bracket. And how far is this from being associative? Also is given by a certain function g, which depends only on the lambda bracket. So this is completely analog to what happens uh, when we move from the algebra to Poisson algebra and uh, associative algebra. And uh, again, we can uh, consider also some filtration on the universal affine vertex algebra, and we have the, a way to go from a non-commutative object to a commutative object using the associated graded. And that's the philosophy which I would like to use to, to give a definition of cubeform W algebras. So now these Lie algebras or Lie conformal algebras are a certain object which uh, in a paper by Bacalov, series of paper by Bacalov, and Andrea and Katz are called the pseudo-algebra. So there are certain objects in pseudo-tensor categories. So now one suggestion is in order to study this skewed deformation, we should look at the analog object. We should look at what is a, a pseudo-algebra, not in the category of vector space of, of C of C module, but of C of SS inverse module. So now the action of the, there is an operator which is invertible acting on our vector space. And this leads to the notion of multiplicative Lie conformal algebras. So I'll try to give a motivation why we should consider this invertible operator acting uh, on uh, this. And uh, you should think that this invertible operator, if you think of a lattice, is moving us, S is moving us on the right of the lattice, S inverse is moving us on the left. So this will give rise to certain uh, differential difference equations. So with discrete equation, on a space variable. So let me try to explain a little bit how can we get the lambda bracket from the usual definition of a vertex algebra. So suppose we have a vertex algebra V. I think uh, you know much better than me what it is. And uh, so in a vertex algebra, we usually have a state field correspondence. So to each element of the vertex algebra, we associate a quantum field with some properties. And uh, this quantum field, the, the, the coefficients are endomorphism of the vertex algebra. So given A in V, Y of A, Z acts on B. So we get a series, Laurent series in Z. And then we can take this residue of the series times e to the lambda z. This is called the formal Fourier transform. This gives certain uh, polynomial. So this is, requires few computation, but it's not hard to see. So this is a polynomial and the, it encodes the singular part of the OP. That's why it's polynomial, because we know that there are only a single uh, finite number of poles.
And normally of the product which I was talking before is just, so if you want this singular part, we may write, it gives us information about the hand product when n is greater or equal than zero. And then this normally ordered product, which is defined this way, we now take the density of the inverse y z applied to b. So this is immediate computation. It's just a minus one b. So now there is a certain operator acting on the vertex algebra, the translation operator, and it allows to recover all the negative end product starting from a minus one b. There is a very famous formula. So uh, as you see, this lambda bracket uh, and this uh, normally order product allows to recover all the end product of the vertex algebra. So there, it's just an equivalent uh, definition. And uh, let me just give an example of um, to state few axioms. So this lambda bracket, uh, satisfy a certain set of axioms, which I will write later for the multiplicative case, but I'll just wrote very briefly here. So the first line of axioms is called sesquilinearity, and it's just telling us that the translation, translation operator is a, a derivation for the lambda bracket if we put all these together. And there, there are two identities that, as we expect, should be similar to skew symmetry and Jacobi identity for Lie algebra, since this is the same object, but in a different category. So the second and third identity are the analog of skew symmetry and Jacobi identity. And uh, how can we recover uh, all the properties which allow us to define a vertex algebra using lambda bracket? Well, for example, Everything follows from the usual axiom properties of vertex algebra. So there is this Q-symmetry axiom in the vertex algebra. And now we can, uh, as I told you before, the, hand, the lambda bracket uh, captures the non-negative product. So if we put the coefficients of non-negative powers of Z of this Q-symmetry, then we will see that we get exactly the Q-symmetry of the lambda bracket in the Lie conformal algebra. And if we equate uh, the minus one product, so then the minus one, so the coefficient of Z inverse, then we recover this identity which I wrote before. As you see, the how far is this, Lial, this, this vertex algebra from being commutative? This is completely expressed in terms of this lambda bracket. So there is a formula. So we compute the lambda bracket of A lambda B, and we use the convention that we always put points of lambda on the left. So if we do this, after integrate, it makes sense to replace lambda with minus t, which, are, which now is acting on the coefficients. So this was the famous function f, which I wrote before. So this lambda bracket completely determines the normally ordered product. And uh, of course, if we take Borchers identity and other identity, we can get uh, the function g, which appear in the associativity and the relation between the normally ordered product and the lambda bracket, which is known as non-commutative weak formula. So I, I won't give um, all the details. I think uh, most many of you may know this. It's just an equivalent formulation. But that's the, what I would like to use in order to describe um, this Q deformation of W algebras. So let me first review how these W algebras are defined in the usual setting. So we, we, if we start with a finite dimensional Lie algebra, and we fix us, we, which carries a symmetric divided by uniform, then we can define the so-called Lie conformal algebra of currents. So it's the following C of T module. So it's the C of T module generated by G, and then we, uh, we take a, uh, uh, torsion element, so something which is annihilated by T, we denote with this identity uh, symbol. And the lambda bracket is a polynomial uh, of degree one in lambda for A, B, and G. Then it's extended using this is collinearity and all the properties, which um, I briefly wrote before. So the constant term is just the Lie bracket, as it happens uh, if there was no lambda in the uh, Lie algebra case. 
And then the, co the coefficient of lambda is a multiple of this uh, central element and is given by this, the value of the bilinear form of A versus B. And as I say, this identity is sent. Uh, it commutes with everything. So how do we get the universal of fine vertex algebra in this setup? As I said, we, given this Lie algebra, Lie conformal algebra, we can get a vertex algebra, the universal of fine vertex algebra, V of R. And then we just give a value to this identity element, which is uh, central. So we can set it to BK. And this is the level. So this is a way to recover uh, this um, universal of fine vertex algebra. And uh, let me try to write down an explicit element of the center of this algebra. So for example, if we take G simple, then we may assume that the bilinear form is non-degenerate. We fix uh, um, a basis and it's dual with respect to this bilinear form. And then we can define this uh, element L, which is half the sum of uh, the normal of the product U lower I, U upper I. So this is a very well-known element, which is uh, it comes from the so-called uh, Sugawara construction. And one can write down the lambda brackets. So if you take the lambda bracket of L with an element A in G, then this is very, it has this very nice form. So it's K minus a certain number, which I want to call the critical level, which multiplies lambda plus T acting on A. And if we take the lambda bracket of L with itself, so there is again this overall factor K minus the critical level. And now we have some uh, third order polynomial, which is uh, very well known. It's kind of the defined relation of the Virasoru informal vector. So this critical level is uh, minus one half omega, where omega is the eigenvalue of this uh, capital omega. It's just the casing of the joint representation. So we see that if, now we fix k to be the critical level, the right hand side of the lambda bracket of L with itself will be zero. And then L will be an element of the center. So this is a way to construct a certain element of the center. And why the center carries a Poisson vertex algebra structure? As I say, we need to consider a certain uh, um, filtration given by k. And so what do we do? We divide the lambda bracket by one over k minus the critical level, and then we take the limit. So in this way, we get a Poisson vertex algebra structure. And a Poisson vertex algebra structure is a commutative object. Because now the center, in the center of the lambda bracket vanishes. So the normally ordered product of AB is equal to the normally ordered the product BA. So we get a real a commutative and associative. Also the associativity becomes trivial. So this center carries the structure of a Poisson vertex algebra in this way. And the explicit example for SL2, actually, we cannot find anything else that uh, uh, L and its uh, uh, T images and polynomials in this object in the center of this uh, uh, w uh, universal affine vertex algebra. And this is what is known as the classical W algebra of SL2 at principal level. So now the lambda bracket becomes the following. It's the Virasoro lambda bracket for a certain uh, charge C, which is this number, uh, the critical level over six. So now this is usually called the central charge. And uh, the classical level, this is uh, kind of inessential. I mean, it disappears as we expect because we are taking some certain limits. So we are, we, we always get something which has fixed central charge. This is known as Virasoro Magri Poisson vertex algebra. So we should think of this Poisson vertex algebra as similar to a vertex algebra, but all the quantum correction disappear. So it's a classical object, similar to what happens when we go from associative algebra to symmetric algebra of Kirchhoff Poisson uh, type. And now, okay, we are, I try to explain briefly how is this is obtained at least in one example. And now we replace the vertex algebra, universal affine vertex algebra at the critical level with the universal um, vertex algebra of GF. So let's see how this element L looks like. So this is what uh, um, I've done in the com explicit computation, for example, Fagin and Frankel when proving their theorem. So now we have to substitute L with a certain uh, object, which is very similar to the format that we had before. 
the only difference is that now we are replacing this um, elements UI with some series, which are as follows. And we need to combine this series, and I'm still using this normal order product in this way. So this is called the normal order product of quantum fields. And this is again exactly the Sugawara construction. If now we equate powers of Z, this Ln becomes an infinite series. That's why we need to complete our space. So it's not defined in the universal of vertex algebra, in this universal enveloping algebra, but is we need to complete, we need to allow a certain type of infinite series. And so what can we do in this case? Now we can continue some bracket, similar to what we had done before for vertex algebra, we can replace this for associative algebra, take the limit uh, um, and get certain Poisson bracket between Ln and Lm. But it's nice to, it's useful to rewrite this using generating series. And if we rewrite, we get the following formula, which is very similar to the formula for the lambda bracket of uh, Virasoro type. The difference is that now T becomes derivation with respect to W and uh, lambda is substituted by delta. May, or maybe better to write lambda to the n becomes derivation of this delta. And delta is the so-called delta function, formal delta function, so it's the following series. So now we get the uh, distribution here. And this is possible to cue the form, this distribution. So what um, um, Frankel and Reschetti can need is to give a kind of Q version of the Sugawara, Q the form version of the Sugawara construction. And uh, I won't write down the explicit formula because it takes some time. Uh, so we need to, to define this, for example, in this case of SL2, we need to define the quantum affine algebra associated to SL2 hat. And in order to do this, it is convenient to use the infer generators. But it requires some time. But the construction is analogous to what happens for the um, Sugawara construction. So there will be some elements E, some series E, some series F, and some series which we may call K plus K minus coming from these infer generators. Now we need to be a little bit more careful. But the philosophy is the same. And so we can write down the series. Most coefficient also need to live in some completed space because we become each coefficient of z will become an infinite series. And we can write down the Poisson bracket of Vn and Vm. But it's more convenient to write down the corresponding Poisson bracket on the generating series. So we can write it explicitly. So it's not, it's not much important, uh, the formula, but it's important to stress out the analogies that we, we have. So I want to put a parameter because it makes some computation easier later, but so we have this distribution, which is now, it's a distribution which does not involve anymore the delta function. There is this delta of z over qw or delta of qz over w, so how, how can we, how, how did we arrive from, from this, from the usual delta function? Well, if you think of x, if you think of z as e to the x in the previous equation, and if you think of w as e to the minus y, then we arrive at this kind of uh, multiplicative version of the delta function. So we, we, we got from kind of additive version, which has delta of x minus y, to a multiplicate, which is kind of delta of x over y or z over or z over w, if you want to change names. And also what happens, we, we have a certain action of uh, e over w in previous formula, which is it disappear here. But see now we have certain, uh, there is a different action here. Because, for example, we are taking our delta function z over w and we are multiplying by q inverse or by q. So now the, there is another option which uh, I want to denote by s, which sends certain uh, distribution a to a times qz. 
So really, we are kind of uh, moving from an additive world to a typical world. And then this, this object is a little bit nasty because it's uh, non local. So there is this uh, infinite series. But that's not a big problem. We will solve it soon. So this object is not local. While for vertex algebra, we always want to work with local distribution. So the formula itself is not very important. What is important is that now we are two-deforming and our delta function becomes a multiplicity, kind of a multiplicity delta function. And our derivative V, which was encoding the action of the translation operator, becomes multiplication by Q. So any, and we can also multiply by Q inverse if we think of Q as a parameter. Okay, so what happens now at this object? So the right hand side is now different from what happens for uh, vertex algebra. It's kind of, we should think of it as the operator product expansion of distribution, which now are not supported, uh, are not singular on the diagonal Z equal W, but they, have, they may allow a final number of poles. For example, they were, we were multiplied by Q by Q inverse. And these poles appear on Z equal Q to the IW. And as I tried to say before, there is a certain uh, homo automorphism now acting on this distribution by multiplication by Q, and its inverse is multiplication by Q inverse. Yeah, the only problem in this, uh, uh, this form is that we don't have locality, but we can perform a change of variable. Nothing, not too bad. We can perform this change of variable having some fun in writing uh, down the explicit formula, which uh, it, again, it's not very important. So we get something, as I say, so the coefficient of epsilon is easy to compute. That's why I wanted to collect. The, so the coefficient of epsilon can be computed as PG is the following. The other, the other one is a little bit more complicated and it defines a certain algebra known as tactashan fadiev algebra. So let's forget about this. Let's have a look at the coefficient of epsilon. So what happens is that now, if we multiply by a suitable z minus q to the nw, certain copies of z minus q to the nw, this coefficient becomes zero. So now our distribution is not local in the sense of vertex algebra, but it's q local. Because now we, had, we don't have uh, poles on the on z equal w, but we have poles on z minus z equal q to the i w. So if we multiply by all these poles, then we remove the singularity. And this is something which, have, which is similar to what happens in the RDD case. So for vertex algebra, we have certain powers of z minus w kills derivative of delta function. Here we have the certain z minus q to the n w kill our automorphism automorphism applied to the delta function. So it's very uh, kind of translation of what's happening in the additive world and in the um, Q-deform world, multiplicative, I like to say, since uh, we can get this formula by taking the logarithm uh, the exponential of or the previous formula that we know. And uh, so how do we get this uh, multiplicative Poisson vertex algebra or uh, Lee conformal algebras? So the idea is similar to what we have done before. Previously, we applied the formal Fourier transform to the singular part of the OP. Now we need to apply in a different transform, which is kind of um, analog for Q the form uh, for Q local formal distribution, which is known as Mellin transform. And after we apply this Mellin transform, we get something which contains the variable Q, and to make it similar to what I explained before, let's set q equal lambda. So let me define this uh, Mellin transform. So, and if you think a little bit about uh, changing, uh, so in the, the form of the transform, we were multiplying by e to the lambda times z. And now if we remove, if we think of w as e to the x, z equal e to the minus x, or maybe the opposite as i done before, we recover exactly the same. But so. This Mellin transform is in the same spirit of the formal Fourier transform for vertex algebra, 
but we need to multiply now our um, um, singular part of the OP by this W over Z. And now and then we need to consider this multiplicative residue, which means take the coefficient of Z to the zero, not take the coefficient of Z inverse as a, in the previous case. And as we expect, the Meiling transform of a certain uh, action, an action of our operator on the delta function is exactly Q to the N. And after we replace Q by lambda, we get lambda to the N. So I didn't write this lambda bracket before, which was corresponding to the um, lactagian fadiev algebra. But if we do this for uh, the other uh, the, the coefficient of epsilon, then we get this uh, formula. So this is how to get this multiplicity lambda bracket. So again, formula is not uh, very important, but it's important that you understand uh, where the object lives so that we can make uh, a formal definition. So first of all, Let's have a look at the powers of lambda. So now we may allow also lambda inverse. So now we are having lambda lambda inverse, but what is important that is this is polynomial. So if we have a look at polynomial at the polynomial part, we get a lot of polynomial dependence on this lambda. Well, previously we only get the polynomial dependence. And this is because now we need to record the action of S and the action of S inverse. That's why there, there is also lambda inverse. Now let's have a look at each coefficient of lambda. So it's a certain uh, polynomial in the variables S to the N apply to U. So, and this is a, a C of S as inverse module. So just uh, S, of course, S to the N is just S to the N plus one U. And then we extend by imposing that this is an automorphism. So this is now the object that we want to look. We want to define a lambda bracket over C of S of S inverse module. And the lambda bracket is uh, not a polynomial dependence, but a lot of polynomial dependence on lambda. So I hope I try to motivate a little bit. Let me just write down the explicit uh, definition. So now we take, uh, since we are in the um, Poisson vertex algebra case, so we everything is uh, commutative. So we take a unital commutative associative algebra and we want an automorphism. So it is a C of S as inverse module. And then our lambda bracket, uh, it's important that they may have also uh, powers of lambda inverse, but still it's polynomial dependence on this lambda inverse. And uh, we call multiplicative lambda bracket. And now, really, if we exponentiate all the axioms of the conform algebra, which I wrote before, we get sesquilinearity, skew symmetry, and Jacobi identity. So before, the sesquilinearity was telling us that the operator T was a derivation. And now, the, ses the sesquilinearity is telling us that automorphism S is an automorphism of the lambda bracket. And then skew symmetry, Jacob identity, since these are uh, kind of the same object in a different category, resemble the skew symmetry, Jacob identity for Lie algebras. And of course, we have lambda bracket and we have a product on V. So there is some relation, which is given by the Leibniz rule, as we should expect. Similar to the Leibniz rule for Poisson algebra, but now we have this lambda dependence. So I didn't write explicitly the definition of Poisson vertex algebra, to go back, just take the logarithm. <laughs> so this is exactly how to move from uh, uh, usual Poisson vertex algebra to this uh, Q deformed Poisson vertex algebra. And let me give a relation with differential difference equation. So this is inspired by invariable system by physicists, mathematical physicists. So usually with quotient, V by the action of S minus one. And uh, this space is what it's called in uh, classical criteria, local functional. And F is called the density of this local functional. So this space of local functionals loses now the structure, the product of V, because there is an integral. So it's, we cannot multiply these two integrals. So this is suggestive way to denote these cosets. But we can define uh, the Lie bracket of two elements like this. 
And how can we define the knee bracket? So we want to use the multiplicity lambda bracket. So we have to take the lambda bracket of f and g. But we want to remove the dependence of lambda. So for example, we set lambda to be equal to the multiplicative identity. And then we get an element of v, and then we consider its coset. So this is can, one can be sure that it's a well-defined Lie algebra structure. And this Lie algebra acts on v, on the, uh, on the densities, by some derivation which commute with s. These are known as commutative uh, evolutionary vector field. And the action, uh, just I want to write with the same symbol as the Lie bracket because it's basically the same formula. So now it suffice to set lambda equal to one to get an element of V. And so this gives uh, a way to define a Hamiltonian vector field. So just take mu over dt, the action of this vector field uh, associated to this local function. And this gives uh, now a differential difference equation because this vector field commute with S so we can just get an equation of so if we call, if we apply n time s so we get the equation for any state of the lattice since this commute and uh, yeah let me give an example for this uh, uh, Volterra lattice that we have mentioned before so we have polynomial in uh, one variable u and all the possible images through powers of s. So let me let me denote this by u n. So s u n goes to u n plus one. So for simplicity, u is just u zero. And let's take the simplest uh, case, this Volterra lambda bracket. And if we now take as a local function this very simple uh, function integral of u we get this equation, which is called the Volterra lattice equation. It's kind of describes this prey predator uh, distribution of population. So this is kind of relation with this um, um, integrable system. And what does it mean to be integrable? So it means that our Hamiltonian function, like uh, integral of u here, can be included in an infinite dimensional billion subalgebra. So there are several de definitions, but this is one that we can uh, assume. So it, it means that we can now construct infinitely many equations and all the close commute, more or less. This is the statement. And uh, how to describe two different W algebras now? So now we let me just make a specific example for SLN. So the Q-the form W algebra for SLN would be polynomials in a certain number of variables mi, i, i from one to n minus one, and all the possible images of through the operator S, through the shift S of the lattice. And then a very nice convenient way is to uh, introduce this uh, kind of generating series, which collects all these elements. And then we need to write also plus one, which I forgot. So we take this series, which is now a polynomial since we are looking for at SLN. And then, so this is kind of difference operator. And we can write down the lambda bracket in terms of this operator. And again, formula is not that important, but this is called a Wadler type for some reason, I'll try to explain soon. So this L star appearing here is just um, a joint of uh, difference operator. So this formula is not very important for itself. So here there appears the non-locality. But what's, what is important is that every time we have certain operators satisfying this, pro, this formula in any uh, algebra of inference polynomial like this, then automatically we can talk about uh, two deform W algebras, multiplicity uh, Poisson vertex algebra in general, and uh, integrability. And this is because this formula comes from our matrices. 
And if you, you, you should expect this comes from the R matrix of quantum affine W algebra for this case. So this just, I wanted to show how to uh, give a splitted uh, construction of this. And then, uh, yeah, we can forget about star for the moment. Just important that to each, to any R matrix, we can write down an explicit equation star. And uh, how to apply this. So, well, as I said, so we take a pseudo difference operator, which is a Wagner type for the correspondence. So it, it satisfies a certain formula coming from uh, an R matrix. So it satisfies star for some R matrix. Then automatically, the coefficient generate a Poisson vertex, a multiple Poisson vertex algebra. So like in this example, if you didn't know anything about Q deformation, just, you know, that the coefficient of this operator generates a certain multiple Poisson vertex algebra. Now it's possible to identify with the Q deformed W algebra, but a priori, it has an interest of its own. And then we can write uh, an integrable hierarchy. And this integrable hierarchy, this is something uh, uh, very standard in the theory of uh, integrable system can be written in Lux form. What, what does it mean in Lux form? It means that it, it is the commutator of two operators. And one operator is obtained by taking this positive part of fractional powers. So there's a certain power of B which uh, raised to L and we take the positive part. Fractional powers. And uh, let me just state the comment that, so in the previous example, we have A, which was embedded in WQ of SL2. And this was a local object. So we can also find the corresponding uh, other type identity to describe this. And this was non-local. And the, the map was just sending uh, you to this the one which we used to, to get a new local Q formal distribution to a local one. So it was something like VSV. And this is the analog of something that I think many of you know, kind of neural transform. So this can be generalized if we want to any, in this particular example, to any AN on WQSLN. So there is kind of something strange which is happening here that is uh, now it's uh, this mirror transform in the Poisson vertex algebra, in the Poisson vertex algebra and vertex algebra case, also always send something local to something local. Here it's sending something local to something non local. So it means that the screening operators are kind of weird to compute. But nevertheless, they can compute in by factorizing. Uh, this difference operator L of S. So if we write down a factorization, we move from variables B to variables U. And that's how we get uh, kind of the use, the, uh, the other definition of a W algebra using screening operator. So yeah, this was just a comment because somehow sometimes uh, there are so many definition of uh, W algebra was trying to say that can, uh, can be fitted uh, also in this picture. And uh, yeah, I think I'm finishing here. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Daniele. If you have questions for Daniele, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you, Daniele. Thank you.